Worship sometimes is the best part of my day. I think that lightens our heart so much, and I think it has this morning. Also, the adventure that he's put in front of us with the uh, evangeli evangelization opportunity has really excited my heart. I hope it has yours. It's a, it's a step for this church as a group. It's a step for our hearts in worshiping the Lord in action. And I hope we're all part of that. Uh, I know my family will be. We're going to turn now to Exodus for today's reading. It'll be in <clears throat> Exodus 25, 31 through 40. Exodus 35. Let me pray first. Father, your wisdom you've given us so freely. You offer us your life, Father. I see the devastation you've experienced on the cross, Father, and yet you have such a glorious future for us as your children. You've been giving us, Father, everything we need to do everything for your glory. And Father, this group of, of people, Father, wants to know more about you, Father. Would you open our hearts to the word and provide for us, Father, more of your presence so that we may go out and glorify you. Let's turn to the uh, 31st verse. We'll start there. It says, make a, laps, a lampstand of pure gold. Hammer out its base and shaft and make its flower-like cups, buds and blossoms of one piece with them. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three on one side and three on the other. Three cups shall, like almond, flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on one branch, three on the next branch. And the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand, there are to be four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and the third bud under the third pair six branches in all. The buds and branches shall all be of one piece with the lampstand hammered, hammered out of pure gold. Then make it seven lamps and seven and set them up on it so that they may light the space in front of it. Its wick trimmers and trays are to be of pure gold. A talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all these accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. You may sit down. Beautiful singing this morning, church. We say often that the best instrument that we have is the voice of the congregation and it was great to hear that instrument played so well this morning and think singing through such wonderful songs let's uh let's go to the lord in prayer and then we will jump into this passage this morning i'd like to pray from psalm 52 verses 8 and 9 so join with me as we go to the lord in prayer lord your word says that I am like an, a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. Lord, help us to be like the psalmist, like the green olive tree firmly planted in the love of God. We pray this morning that as we come to this passage, looking at the lampstand in the tabernacle, Lord, that we would see more than just a piece of furniture, but we would see how it is foreshadowing for us the work of Christ. And we pray that we would put our trust in him today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love coming home at night and seeing a light on in the house. Uh, growing up, we lived at the end of a very long 
road. And we have these things in North Carolina called woods, where there's lots of trees clumped together. And it almost makes like this dark tunnel at night where you're driving down this long road. And at this point, there was no other houses built on this road. And so we would drive down this long road to get to our house at the very end. And, and at night, it, it's super dark going down this road. This house had an apartment, like a, like a casita that was built onto the house that my grandparents lived in. And um, they used to put these electric candles in the windowsill. Maybe you, you do that in your home or you have memories of someone who would put those candles in their windowsill. And, and I would love coming, coming down, driving down that dark, long road and seeing the lights on in the house because it meant that someone was home. It meant that my grandparents were there. They were home and we'd get to go and spend some time with them. God's dwelling place has a light that is always on as a constant reminder to us that he's always home, that he's always present, that he's never on a trip, that he's never far away, he's never distant, he's never leaving you on your own to come home at night in the dark. He's there. He's present. And that's what we're going to look at this morning in Exodus chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. If you listen to Keith read that passage and you had no idea what he was talking about, don't worry, you're not alone because even Moses, tradition has it that even Moses in hearing the instructions from God said, I don't know what that's supposed to look like. I don't know what you're describing for me. And even our last verse seems to indicate that maybe God had to show Moses a picture of what this was going to be like. I notice in verse 40 at the very end, and see that you make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown you on the mountain. Now we know the whole tabernacle is patterned after the heavenly dwelling place of God. But it's not until we get to the lampstand that this piece of furniture uniquely says that God showed Moses a pattern of how to build it. God is building his dwelling place in Israel's camp so that God's people will never forget God's name again. When we began the book of Exodus, the people were far from God in Egypt and they're uh, Pharaoh had forgotten God's name. He'd forgotten Joseph's name. By extension, forgetting God's name. The people of Israel in the midst of affliction cried out, but but they didn't cry out to God. And yet God in his sovereignty still heard their prayers. God is teaching Israel through the tabernacle that he will be their constant companion as they travel through the wilderness and into the promised land. The light of the lampstand is reminding Israel that God's presence will endure with them. And it invites them to come and draw near. That's what I want to call you to do this morning. To come and draw near to the life-giving presence of God. Come and draw near to the life-giving presence of God. Now, the way we're going to go through this text is we're going to look at how the presence of God gives life and how the presence of God gives light. Okay, so how the presence of God gives life and how the presence of God gives light. You notice right away as we begin in verse 31 that there are a couple of differences from the other pieces of furniture that we have looked at so far in Exodus chapter 25. Uh, The first difference is that there's no table or box on which to display uh, the main piece of the furniture. You might remember uh, the Ark of the Covenant, right? The Ark of the Covenant was a a box that was going to be set in the Holy of Holies, the most sacred of rooms, but the box had on display on top of it a covering 
or a lid with two angels, two cherubim, facing each other, which was the mercy seat. Almost as if the box was displaying the mercy seat of God for us. Last week, we looked at the table of showbread or the table of presence, as it's often called. The table was built with instruction so that the bread could be displayed on top. But with the lampstand, there's, there, there's no table. Uh, there, there's nothing that it's set on. It, it, so it's probably much larger than we uh, picture in our minds. I, I picture a little menorah sitting on a table with the, the candles coming out of it, but it's probably sitting on the floor, maybe five, six feet high in its, in its height. So it's a big lampstand and it's going gonna, it's gonna to give out a lot of light. But you'll also notice the difference in that this piece of furniture is not made out of wood with gold overlaid. This piece of furniture is made out of pure gold, hammered work, as it says in verse 31, if you want to look at it. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, which is what the ESV says, different than than keys. His was actually much helpful because much more helpful than this one because I actually had to go and look up what calyxes were. They're the buds. Buds and the flowers shall be of one piece with it. Imagine how big that piece of gold had to be to make a lampstand out of hammered work. Not, not just overlaying wood, but of pure gold, hammered work. It would meant that this piece of gold would have to be hammered over and over again. It would have to be constantly put under the fire to be refined and softened so that it could be molded and shaped by the craftsman. And then hammered and hammered again. And then taken back to the fire and, and heated up again so that it could have uh, more and more malleable uh, nature to it so that it could be shaped into the lampstand that is described. And then hammered and hammered again. And then put under the fire again and again and again, over and over and over again until you end up with this beautiful lampstand. Each piece of furniture has shown for us the amazing craft, craftsmanship of both the men and the women of Israel to take the gold, to take the wood, to take the curtains and use their gifts and skills to make the temple that God had set for them. As we're looking at this lampstand, it might be helpful if we have the image of a tree in our mind because I think that's the way the description is presenting the lampstand for us. It's like a, like a tree with branches, right? You even see some of this language of uh, three branches on one side and three branches on the other side. Three cups like almond blossoms or the flowers that would come on a, on a tree. I think there's two kinds of trees images of trees that are being mixed in the metaphor here for us to understand. And it's important that we kind of pull them out so that we understand the image that we're being given here with the lampstand. The first kind of tree that I think is being described is that of an olive tree, that of an olive tree. Now, there's nothing in the text here that would make us think of an olive tree. But there's a number of places throughout the scripture that seems to indicate that the way Israel understood the lampstand was that of an olive tree. I, uh, turn with me over to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah. Zechariah is going to be to the right of Exodus. If you're like me, Zechariah doesn't get a whole lot of reading time in uh, Bible reading, so the pages might still be stuck together. It's going to be right before the New Testament. So if you get to like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you've gone too far. Turn left. You'll find it right before Zephaniah, Haggai, Malachi, those books. Zechariah 
chapter 4. It's good to find new books in the Bible that have not been read that often. Uh, if you're not sure what to do in your Bible reading plan, Zechariah might be it for you this week, right? Go and a couple chapters a day and you'll be through it for, for next week. There's some really good text in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 1, And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me. Zechariah is receiving these visions. He's receiving these instructions. He woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes to be awakened out of their sleep. And that's what's happening here. Eh? The angel's coming. He's awakening Zechariah. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold. What do you begin to think of? Exodus chapter 25 with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it, just like we've already described with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it. See, most people think that what's happening here is that the description is the branches that are coming out on either side being described as the olive tree. Certainly possible with the language that's used here. But this isn't the only place we find this kind of language. Turn to Revelation chapter 11. This one's a little bit easier to find. It's going to be at the end of your Bible. You can turn to the back cover and if you see the maps, just go a little bit to the left of that and you'll end up in Revelation. Revelation chapter 11. A lot we can get distracted by here in uh, Revelation 11, but that's another day, another time. Let's go to verse 4 and look specifically for what we're after here. Notice what it says in verse 4. There, these are two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. These are referring to two witnesses that are being described here who are going to uh, be witnesses for the Lord. All of this is happening in context of the description of the temple. And we have this connection again between olive trees and the lampstand. And so it seems to be that there's an understanding that the lampstand here is designed after the image of an olive tree. Say, okay, great, why in the world would we care whether it's an olive tree or an almond tree? Well, this is important because the image of what it's communicating is really important, okay? One of the things we find as, we were to, as we'll go in Exodus chapter 27 is that the way the lampstand would be supplied with oil is that the people themselves would take olives, they would crush the olives, and they would bring its oil to light the lampstand. And so the way the oil would be provided for this lampstand is through the people crushing the olives, beating the olives, stomping on the olives to create enough oil so that there is continual supply for these lampstands. Well, what's the image here for us? It's that this lampstand that is hammered and beaten and refined with fire, representing an an olive tree, which I think for us is the image of Christ. And we would take the olives, work of his life, beat it and crush it and he would be beaten and afflicted for our transgression and yet it's that oil that then supplies the fuel that would light the fire continually reminding God's people of his presence with them see what's being foreshadowed here is the work of Christ that we would beat and afflict Christ with our sins. He would suffer for our transgression. 
And yet that is what the Lord is doing to remind us of his ongoing, constant, life-giving presence in our lives. But it's not the only tree image here. We also have the image of the almond blossom. This is a different kind of tree with a different kind of flower, different kind of blossom. This one has a different image to it that I think is really important. The almond tree, the almond blossom is the earliest spring flowering tree in Israel. We have uh, in our home, we have some trees in the back that have started to bud already, right? You see the little buds starting to come out and, and wanting to flower. And boy, every time it snows, it's like our trees don't know what to, to do. You know, they're, they're wanting to come out. They're wanting to flower. Uh, all the trees in the front, they have nothing, right? The, the front doesn't get nearly as much sun as the back does. And so we can see the ones in the back. They're starting to heat up with, with the spring weather and they're starting to bud. And we have ones in the front that nothing, uh, nothing yet. And we even have one that's new and we're not sure it's actually going to come back if it's still alive or if it's, if it's dead and we're going to have to replace it. It's nice. This is a beautiful time of year to see the flowers begin to bud off the trees. Well, if you lived in Israel, the almond tree would be the first one that you would see begin to flower for the year. But even more so, this word for almond tree has a, has a unique root in Hebrew. The word shakad, it means to be watchful. It means to be vigilant, right? It's the first tree that blossoms. It's the one that's coming to watchfulness, wakefulness, vigilance first before all the other trees. So we have this image between the olive tree and the almond blossom. Right, that God is watching over his people. The people are bringing the oil, supplying the oil that has been crushed and beaten. God is using that and watching over the people, constantly burning, constantly at watch, constantly vigilant before the people. It's the image of renewing and sustaining life. It's an important image for us today because we need to be reminded of God's renewing and sustaining life-giving work. I mean, it doesn't take us long when we leave here on a Sunday to go back and enter into the normal rhythm of life with the normal pain and sufferings of life, the hardships, the conflicts, the family situations, the uh, jobs that we don't want to be at anymore, or whatever. Like we have all of these, these issues and conflicts that come up, these hardships, and yet to be reminded that God is watching over, that God is vigilant over our lives. And even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of a hardship, the light is on in God's dwelling place. We've been singing a song, God moves in a mysterious way. A hard song to sing as Reuben uh, admitted to us. And by the way, your singing of it as a church is getting better and better each week we sing it. He shared with us a little bit of the author of that song, a man by the name of William Cooper. He was an interesting fella. He was actually... Uh, a lawyer is what he trained to be, and he was appointed a role, 1763, to be the clerk for the House of Lords in England. The public examination of the process was so overwhelming to him that he never fulfilled the role. In fact, the thought of appearing and being examined in public like that sent him into a deep and dark depression. One to where he even attempted to take his own life because of the weight of that event. And yet we get to this song and we read a verse like, his purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. I couldn't help but think about the lampstand 
and think about the bitter, the bitterness of what it took to supply the oil for this lampstand. And yet the sweetness of what it communicated to the people as they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Many of you are walking through a bitter season in life. Lots of questions, lots of mysterious ways of God at work in your life that are not easily or apparently understood. And yet the lampstand is the reminder that God is watching, that God is vigilant, that God has not fallen asleep. He's not gone on vacation. He's not forgotten about you in the midst of difficult times. Sweet will be the flower. But not only does the lampstand remind us that the presence of God gives life it also reminds us that the presence of God gives light. You see, this is the one room in the tabernacle that actually needed to be lit. I was thinking this morning about how many light switches I turned on this morning. I actually, I actually counted uh, throughout the morning. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I turned on the the bedroom light, I turned on the hallway light, uh, I turned on downstairs to make the coffee in the office, uh, come in here, and most of the lights in here were already on, uh, so I didn't have to turn them on, but that would have been a handful of other, about, about eight to ten lights in rooms on a normal morning that I would turn on. If you want to know how I spend my mornings, those are the kinds of things I think about, right, as I'm preparing these sermons, is how many light switches am I turning on? And I think about how easy it is for us to turn on a light, so that we can see where we're going. But you see, the outer courtyard of the tabernacle, it was all open air. It didn't have a covering on it. They didn't need light. They would have had daylight to, to shine on what they were doing. The Holy of Holies didn't need light because the Holy of Holies was entered once a year. And when the high priest entered it, the presence of God was descending upon it like a cloud. His glory would have lit up the room. But this room, the holy place where the priest functioned and did their work, it would have needed light. And I imagine what it would have been like to be a priest and to walk into that room and to feel the warmth of the light that would have been shining as you would have walked in there. This is a big lampstand with multiple places of, of burning to light it up and the warmth that would have come from that lampstand. Walking into a room that's now lit through this lamp. It would have been the brightest lamp in the entire community and camp of Israel. No light would have shone brighter than the light of the lampstand. Who could afford to keep the oil going so long for such a large lampstand? Most of the people would have had tiny lamps in their homes to light certain rooms, and yet this lamp would have provided plenty of light for the entirety of the space. It would have provided such light and warmth. But you see, it's the light that draws us in to the giver of light. You see, light in and of itself isn't to be worshipped, isn't to be enamored with. The light is meant to point us to the one who gave light, to the one who in darkness said, let there be light light and there was light the one who with his mouth spoke light into being who placed the sun to light the day and the stars and the moon to light the night all of these light giving objects to reflect the glory of the one who created them the one who gave them to us they're not meant to be worshipped. They're not meant to be bowed down to. They're meant to 
point us to the creator of that light. You see, it's the light that reflects to us the life that we have in the presence of God. Turn to John chapter 1 with me. John chapter 1. I've read this text a hundred times and yet to come and see it in this perspective of the lampstand, how light and life are connected to one another in this text. Notice what it says. He's talking about the word, right? Which is, which is clearly Jesus as you go through the entirety of chapter one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him, right, in the word, in Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You see how, how the light is the entryway for knowing the one who has life. If you want to come to the one who has life, you come through the light. You come out of darkness and to the one who is light. That's what John is saying here in John chapter 1. The life was the light of men. This is Jesus. See, what this lampstand is anticipating, what it's foreshadowing for us, is the way that the light of Jesus would shine into the darkness and that those who are living in darkness would see the light and through him have life. If you're here this morning and you're living in darkness, Jesus is the light that leads to life. He is the light of the world that brings life. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by Him. Just call you this morning. Walk out of darkness and step into the light. Jesus is shining into the darkness of your life and come to Him today. In the language of the Bible, it's turn from your sin and put your faith, put your trust in Jesus. Make him your treasure to where you love the light more than you love the darkness. And the way Colossians describes it, you are transferred from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. This is what the good news of the Bible is. That you don't have to live in darkness anymore. But you can live in the light. There is some application also for the believer here. And how this language of lamp and light is used throughout the rest of scripture. This idea of a lamp is picked up on in a number of places that shows us how we grab hold of this image and put it into our lives, how we live with it tomorrow, what it changes about how we live. The first one is that it takes us to the word. Word, right? That the lamp, right, is, a, is an image that is applied to the word of God. One of the first verses I learned growing up Old King James was, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, right? A clear connection, right? Your word, Lord, is like a lamp or a light to my path, right? This word that we hold today is a lamp or a light to our path. Here's the thing about a lamp. It's not a spotlight, 
It's not a street light that illumines the whole path for you. Right? You got a lamp that you're holding. It's not going to show you every step that needs to be taken over the course of your life. But what it does show you is the next step that needs to be taken in the course of your life. Right? It won't open up the whole path for you. It won't show you every step or what you're going to need to do 10 years from now. But it, what it promises is that the next step, the word illumines for you to take. This image of holding the word out in front and taking step, one step at a time. How close do you hold God's word out in front of your life? When it comes to taking steps in life, is God's word what's held out in front to illumine the steps that you are taking? We have some skylights in our room. And when we first moved into the house, we loved the skylights. I mean, who doesn't like getting nice daylight coming into their room? And, and, uh, and, and we loved it. We loved the skylights. You know, we, we were getting up early. We we're getting up with, with the sun, you know, the way you're supposed to do it. And, you know, during the summer, that was earlier. During the winter, it might have been a little bit later. Uh, we were just getting up with the sun, and it was great. And, and, and after a while, we began to get tired of the skylights, Got a little tired of waking up with the sun during the summer. We got a little tired of the how hot it got in the afternoon. So we found that they make blinds or shades for skylights. So we got these shades for our skylights. And we installed them and put them in. And, and at first, we would keep the skylights open at times. We might still keep it open at night so we could wake up with the, the sunlight and we close them during the day so it didn't get hot. And, uh, and, and, then, and then, you know, we began to start closing them at night so we wouldn't wake up with the sun and we could sleep in a little bit more and we didn't have to follow the rhythms of the sun and so on and so forth to where now those, those shades are closed all day every day. We don't ever operate with the normal rhythm of the sun and the clock anymore. We just operate whenever we want to get up and whatever we want to do. But I think about that image and wonder how many of us have the shades pulled on the light of God's word. And we got saved and we loved the word and we loved being in the word and we, we followed it and we wanted to know it. And then after a while, you know, we just didn't, we didn't seek it as much and, and we decided to buy some shades. And we still kept them up every once in a while because we knew that the word was good and it was going to lead us and we needed to be in it. But, you know, we just started closing the shades sometimes. We didn't want to hear what it had to say. And then, you know, sometimes the word began to infringe upon how we wanted to live our lives. So then we started closing the shades a little bit more. Before too long, the shades are always closed and the light of the word is no longer illuminating the way forward. Pull the shades up. Get rid of the shades and let the light of the word direct your steps and shine into your life. First, Application is the word. The second application is watchful. This image of lamps calls us to be watchful. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 25 of 10 virgins who go out and they're waiting for the bridegroom to come. They're waiting for the bridegroom who's going to arrive and come. And five of the virgins don't bring any oil for their lamps. Five do. Five of them aren't ready for when the bridegroom comes. The oil in their lamps run out and they don't have any more supply to put back into the lamps to light the way and be ready for the coming of the bridegroom. 
And five of them were ready. They prepared for this. They brought oil so that when the oil burned down, they could put more oil in and they could burn the lamp and they would be watchful and ready. So when the bridegroom came, they were ready. See, the image of the lampstand reminds us that we are to be watchful for the return of Christ. Ready for the moment when he appears, not caught off guard. We are to be watchful and vigilant like God is watchful and vigilant like the almond blossom shows us. Growing up, I used to want the return of Christ to be delayed. I could you just wait till I graduate from high school before you come back, Lord? I could you just wait till I get married? I just want to see what it's like to be married. Could you, could, could you wait till, till I graduate from college? Could you wait till we have kids, right? Just, just delay, 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 because I want the things of this world. Those aren't bad things to want. But it was not watchful, ready, expectant for the return of Christ. That's how we're to live, Christian, as if Jesus would return at any moment. And we are to be ready and to be watchful for the moment of his return. Third word of application is witness. Word, watchful, and witness. There's an old song. Matthew chapter 5. The words just escape me to the song, so we're going to have to turn to the passage so I can remember it. Matthew chapter 5. Oh yeah, this is it. Matthew 5, 15. You are a light of the world, right? This is Jesus preaching in the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to those who are listening. You're a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand and it gives light to all the house. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You all, if you were online, you heard me sing plenty last week when my mic was turned on for the entirety of the service, so I'm not going to sing this one for you. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. You see, this image of a lampstand and the continual burning of God's presence before the people was not meant to be kept concealed. It's meant to be revealed, meant to be brought into the darkness. It's meant to be emanated out of your life to those around you so that they would see the light of Christ shining through you and they would be drawn to the life that is in Jesus alone. You see, we are called as a church to be witnesses, and the lampstand reminds us that we are witnesses to the world around us. I think this is why in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, churches are described as lamps, because they're a witness to the world around them. Right, The way a church looks and operates, the witness of the church is a powerful image to the world around us. Church, we feel like God has called us to be a witness in this downtown area, right? a dark, dark part of our city. And yet it needs the witness of Christians shining the light of Christ, a city set on a hill, a lamp not put under a basket, but put on display, witnessing to the city around us that the life that is found in Jesus. One of the ways you can begin to do that is to simply pick up one of these cards. 
one of these booklets and begin praying for our city, praying that God would give you a heart and a passion, compassion for those in our city who are living in the domain of darkness so that you can tell them about the light that has shone in the darkness and the life that is found in him. The lampstand, it is a tough piece of furniture to envision exactly what this looked like. But one day, when we get to heaven and we see the throne of God, we'll see that there are lampstand around the throne of God. Spirits, the spirit as it says, right? Surrounding the throne of God, which is what's compared here with the lampstand. And we will see and know what it looked like to know this lampstand. But until then, until then, church, hold fast to the word. Be watchful for the coming of Christ and be a witness in the places that God has put you. Lord, we come to you this morning thankful for your word, thankful for this piece of tabernacle furniture, Lord, that is hard to even imagine and picture in our minds. And yet, Lord, we don't have to picture exactly what that lampstand looked like to know what that lampstand calls us to do. Lord, as we think about the olive tree of this image, whose olives were taken and crushed by the people brought to light this lampstand. Lord, we glory in the work of Christ in our place. Lord, we're thinking about our sin, our transgression that, that put him on the cross. Lord, may we rest and take glory in the work of Jesus in our place. And Lord, may we realize that the the image of the lampstand calls us to cling to your word, to remain watchful for your return, and to be a witness in the city that you have put us in. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.